Well, thank you, Frank. And uh, before I uh, introduce our guest today, let me just uh, tell you, in case you're a first-time guest or you've been here for a while and go, you know what sounds different in here today? It should sound different. At five after eight this morning, our main, uh, we had a problem that we had no speakers in this auditorium at all, none. And our team scrambled, a great group of volunteers, that's what they all are, scrambled around and uh, kind of hooked up something to get us going through the service. So we need to thank those volunteers, but hold up for a sec. Yeah, thank them. We also, need, we also need to thank the band because they got no rehearsal because we had no sound. They had no rehearsal this morning. Uh, they rehearsed Thursday night, but they had no, one little sound check, and away we went, and uh, they did an awesome job. So it is great what uh, our teams can pull together when those kind of challenges happen. I want to introduce uh, Andrea Grunwald. Uh, Andrea uh, has a counseling practice called Five Star Relationships. It's a personal counseling, professional counseling for corporations. And um, we have been uh, kind of connected, Andrea, well, she was, her and her husband, Jeff, were coming to Lakeside before I was here. But um, early on, I think it was about 14 years ago, I realized that, that we needed to have the connection with a professional counselor. And uh, so we partnered together and uh, we created, you created what is Journey Counseling and is now Five Star Relationships. And uh, we're pretty excited um, over the year, years of how that has worked so well. And we've been able to send uh, people from Lakeside and uh, others as well. And uh, because sometimes it just requires a professional counselor. So Andrea, welcome today. Glad to have you here. We've known Thank each other did. a long time. And uh, I want to just ask you just a couple of questions this morning. The first question is, is that, I mean, you're counseling hundreds and hundreds of people. Are there uh, two or three dynamics or challenges or struggles that you see are more common than some of the others? Most of the couples I see are having uh, ongoing conflict. That's one of the reasons they come in to see me. And uh, the other is finances. You won't be surprised to hear. And the third thing I see often is issues around parenting and uh, dealing with kids and um, those are probably three of the top issues that people come in with. What I find though um, sort of underlying those issues is that there's often an ongoing pattern of communicating and relating that uh, can become problematic. God's created each of us uh, with two needs. One is security and one is significance. And what I've seen over the 15 years I've been doing this is that pretty much in every single couple I've seen, there's one of each in the relationship. And so what happens is uh, the person who is the, the connector and wants to connect for closeness tries to connect. And uh, the other person who is about uh, significance, identity and responsibility and doing things, getting things done. When that person could, tries to connect with them for closeness, they usually back up. And uh, over time, the person whose needs not getting met because they want to be close can become critical. And um, the person who is about identity and, and wanting to accomplish and be responsible and do things well feels like they're failing. And so it creates a relational dynamic and, the, and pattern in the relationship that sort of creates an ongoing uh, pattern of conflict. I mean, you've, you've talked to couples and parents with kids, and, and there's been, you know, hundreds of those people over the years that you have been a professional counselor. Do all relationships make it, or are they all salvageable? Well, I like to believe that uh, relationships are salvageable with the right kind of work. However, the one thing that I, I think um, sort of puts the death nail in a coffin, so to speak, is if, if there is one person who doesn't want to work on the relationship and just decides that they are finished and uh, exits the relationship, there's really not much the other person can do. Yeah, it's, I mean, it is two people in a relationship that need to be sort of cooperating and working together with the same focus and the same goal. If you just uh, could give us two or three, you know, simple pieces of advice. You know, when you, you kind of say, okay, over the years, these are the two or three pieces of advice I've probably given most often. What would those two or three pieces of advice be? Well, the first piece of advice, which probably won't come as a surprise, is to listen. And, uh, you know, I like to talk about sort of listening with curiosity. Become a student of your partner and the person you're in relationship with. Uh, really try to understand them, have empathy. Uh, try to understand their world and where they're coming from. There's a great quote that says, seek first to understand and then to be understood. And if we could do that a little bit more, I think we would really um, come from a place of then knowing and understanding, not being judgmental, and we'd get out of that critical uh, kind of pattern that we can get into. 
Uh, the second is to be intentional about meeting your partner's needs. So if you know that your partner uh, is a person who likes to connect, then be intentional about trying to have that time set aside to be able to connect. And that doesn't mean just going grocery shopping together. Uh, that means that you know, you're spending some time connecting, talking to each other, hearing about each other's feelings, and um, you know, connecting over hopes and dreams. And if you know that your partner is about identity and responsibility, give them the, the, uh, the margin to be able to do that in their life, that they have the time to accomplish and do and those kinds of things. And that way you're both intent, you know, being intentional about trying to uh, kind of meet those needs. In order to do that, you really do need to come from a place of being able to share your needs your opinions, your feelings from an I perspective, I feel, and to be vulnerable. And those are two things in our society that aren't that easy. Um, it's easier to say, you know, you this and you that, um, but to come from that perspective of I feel and um, I need and can we work this out together. And then I think at the end of the day, you know, that um, it's good to seek out resources. That's one of the real upsides in our society um, is that we have a lot of resources. So two books I recommend to people in relationship. The first is Hold Me Tight by Sue Johnson. And the second is Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. You don't have to be married to read that book. It's got some really great relational um, dynamics in there. And uh, the other is to seek professional help. You know, see a counselor who can help you work through some of those things, whether they're individual things around identity and significance or whether they're um, relational patterns that have started to develop in the relationship around those two things. If someone here at Lakeside wanted to make an appointment with you to see a professionally trained counselor like yourself, uh, how would they go about that? Yeah, so uh, to make an appointment, you can phone the office here at Lakeside. You can book an appointment with me through Deb Saunders, my assistant, or you can leave a message on my voicemail. It's confidential. Uh, one of the things that Dave and I talked about when we started this 14 years ago, doesn't seem that long, but no, I guess it is. It is that long, um, yeah that uh, you know, we really wanted to be very, very um, careful about privacy and confidentiality. So my voicemail is confidential and I have a filing cabinet with all my files in it and uh, that file cabinet is locked up. I'm the only one who has a key to it. And so we really work hard um, to protect everyone's privacy and confidentiality. And one of the other things I'll mention is I think, you know, generally speaking, you know, we're all kind of doing our best. We're all trying. We're all um, putting our best foot forward. We're, we're making an effort. And uh, so be gracious and kind to each other, you know, whomever you're in relationship, whether it's a dating partner, a marriage partner, your children, um, in community here. Uh, come from that place of expectation that people are trying their best. And when it's not working out, um, it's usually because they need some help. And, and uh, with some guidance, they can, they can uh, get it going in a good way. There's lots of good advice in those about seven or eight minutes that we talked here today, so thanks for that good advice. If you need a professional counselor, uh, Andrea is a great one, so uh, uh, please, um, you can be part of that. And uh, we're going to turn our attention now to the side screens, just sort of our little intro promo video as we get set up for my talk today. Thanks, Dave. Okay, there we go. Well, we're in week two of this series, Relationship That Rocks. And as we started last week, this series, we looked at this dynamic of what do we do when someone we're in a relationship with, it can be friendships, it can be a marriage, it can be with our kids, it can be what with any kind of relationship. What happens when in that relationship, something happens that's sort of out of the norm? Something that, you know, hasn't happened for a long time or maybe has never happened is sort of out of character for the other person. What is it that we naturally do when that happens? And I said that we're really confronted with a choice at that point. We can, one, choose to believe the best, give the benefit of the doubt, think well of the other person, 
or the opposite choice is to assume the worst, thinking bad thoughts and bad you know, ideas and notions about the other person and why this behavior has happened. And in our culture, because our culture is somewhat cynical and skeptical, it is so easy for us to assume the worst, and so often we go that way. But I said that if relationships are going to rock, we have to more often believe the best and move in that direction, but it is not easy and it does not come naturally. And I said there are really three things that we need to do to better believe the best of somebody else. And they came uh, from the words of Peter, who's addressing a church, and he talks about being like Christ in different other ways, and he's talking about being like Jesus in relationships. And he says that we need to have this clear thinking, because our thinking can get so cloudy and uh, it gets, you know, things of our past and all sorts of things cloud our thinking, that we need to clear that up. We need to clear it up by asking what in our past is affecting our present thinking. We need to maybe, um, you know, avoid getting someone else's opinion on an issue because sometimes that will cloud our thinking, and we need to make sure we get the facts and we listen really carefully. So we need to have clear thinking. We need to control our emotions. Sometimes emotions get so engaged that we need to do the best we can to control our emotions, and often that, need, uh, that comes from prayer. Simply by just praying about the situation, about what's going on, and allowing prayer to calm us down. And then thirdly, I said, really above all, he says, is that we need to deepen the relationships because the deeper the relationship, the more often we will, as he said, we will cover over or we will wrap in the blanket of love, we'll cover over a multitude of small missteps and misunderstandings. And so we have that first choice that we can believe the best or assume the worst. But relationships that rock move more towards believing the best more often. Now. You can't do any kind of a relationship series if you don't deal with the whole issue of conflict. You can't, because relationships that rock are not conflict-free relationships. If you believe that a relationship that rocks doesn't have conflict, and you have no conflict as the number one sort of ultimate measuring tool of a relationship that rocks, you're gonna be sorely disappointed in every relationship that you get into, because every relationship has conflict. It just does. The idea that a relationship doesn't have conflict is a myth. Conflict is commonplace in all relationships, good ones, bad ones. It happens to the best, and it happens to the worst of relationships, and here's why. Here's why it happens. You take one sinner, and you add a second sinner, and you put them into a relationship, and you're bound to have conflict. You take one broken person with their unique personality and temperament, and you put them in a relationship with a second person with their brokenness and their personality and their temperament, and you put them into close proximity with one another, you are going to have conflict because we have, all have habits that at times we cannot control. We have past deeds and hurts that we cannot undo. We all have flaws that we can't correct, c correct and you take two people and you connect them with all of that in a close relationship, there's going to be conflict. You see, conflict doesn't make or break a relationship. In fact, a good relationship is not the absence of conflict. A good relationship is, and what makes or breaks that good relationship is what do you do when conflict comes? Because it does. One of my favorite books that talk about people connecting in community is a book by uh, pastor and author John Ortberg, and the book is called, and I love the title, Everyone is normal until you get to know them. And I think that's so true. Everyone is normal until you get to know them. And once you get to know someone, you kind of understand that. And in the book, he talks about this animal right here. Yell it out, what is it? Porcupine, it is a porcupine. And a porcupine has 30,000 quills attached to their body, and they're primarily for the protection against some kind of an attacker. And each quill can be driven into the body of someone the porcupine doesn't like, and the body heat of that other person or creature causes the barb to expand, become painfully embedded. It's very difficult to free yourself from it. And then the wound can fester and become infected, and it can be incredibly painful. Porcupines, as a general rule, have two methods of handling the relationship. They withdraw or attack. I think broken people kind of often do those same things as well. 
But like all of us, like all creatures, the porcupine doesn't like to be alone. It likes the company of other porcupines. And so in late autumn, late autumn a young porcupine's thoughts turn to love. But love can be a risky adventure if you're a porcupine. Because there's this dilemma, right, with the quills. How do you get close without being hurt? And how do you get close without hurting another? That's the dilemma of the porcupine. And Ortberg says that what they do is they find a way to do this. It's called the dance of the porcupine. They figure how to get close without getting too badly hurt. And I think that's exactly what we want. We want to get close. We want to connect. In fact, it's a key part of life is to connecting with others. But how do we do it without getting hurt and causing too much hurt? Because we all have barbs or quills, don't we? There's the barb of rejection or resentment or arrogance, pride and superiority. Barbs of envy and jealousy and contempt and selfishness and anger. Bitterness, criticism, perfectionism, brokenness, past wounds and hurts. That's just a few of them. And we have these barbs attached and yet we want to get close and we wonder, how do we do this? How do we do this? And I think we also must learn to do the dance of the porcupine. Learn to get close without badly hurting someone or being badly hurt ourselves. And it is a bit of a dance. We need to learn to negotiate or maneuver through this tunnel of chaos called conflict. None of us wants to go there. Most people would rather avoid it if they could at any cost. But if we're going to have relationships that rock, we have to choose to enter the tunnel of conflict with all its chaos, with all its fears, with all its anxiety, with all its responses. Relationships that rock are people who say, we're going into that tunnel. And some of you who have gone into that tunnel and you've kept your little relational boat afloat even though the water has been pretty rough and pretty turbulent, and you've kind of come out the other side and you're now exp experiencing smoother waters in your relationship, and you know what that's like, and it's a good feeling. But some of you know all too well that you entered this tunnel of conflict, or maybe you avoided it altogether, kind of stayed outside the tunnel on the sort of the front end, but some of you went into that tunnel, and the water was rougher than you ever thought it would be, and it was too rough to handle and your little relational boat tipped over, left you both gasping for some kind of breath, and the relationship just didn't make it and didn't survive. It was a past relationship. Because sometimes the road to conflict is rocky. It's uphill. There are too many hurts, too much bitterness, too many resentments, too many whatever, and they just don't survive. Now, I want to say a little side note, and I want you to hear me real carefully on this. There are some relationships that should not stay afloat. There are some relationships for a variety of reasons they need to end. There are some relations that, relationships that are just not healthy to anybody in the relationship. There's this continual conflict. There's this continual turmoil. They continue to suck the life out of one another. There's toxicity. There's poison. There's this wrecking of, of emotional uh, well-being. There are relationships that sometimes just need to end. They just do. Some relationships shouldn't be reconciled or restored. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't forgiveness, and that doesn't mean that there isn't friendship, and that doesn't mean that you don't think well of the other person. You know, it, 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 it just doesn't, it means that maybe there isn't going to be this closeness or this connection or this reconciliation or restoration. Now, some of you might say, hey, but hold on, hold on. Doesn't the Bible say that we need to reconcile to one another because we've been reconciled to God? Shouldn't we as Christ followers, shouldn't every Christ follower follower, reconcile every relationship, restore it, keep it tight? The answer would be no. The Bible does not teach that. In fact, in Acts chapter 15, two very close friends who traveled together and worked together named Paul and Barnabas, they got into a rip-roaring conflict. In fact, the Bible says they had a sharp disagreement. That means they were just as mad as whatever at each other. And everybody noticed. And there was lots of things said and lots of things done. And it would have been toxic for them to stay together, be together, work together, remain friends, and see each other regularly. And so in the Bible it says they parted company and they went in the opposite direction. And church history tells us that they forgave one another, they wanted the best for each other, they thought well of each other, but they never relationally connected again. And that's Paul. And he wrote a big chunk of the New Testament. Some relationships shouldn't, but most, most relationships should. And the key point 
that I want to talk about today is this right here. What makes a relationship that rocks is not the absence of conflict, then what makes a relationship that rocks is how we handle conflict, how we handle the reactions, the responses, the emotions, all of that. How do we handle that makes it or breaks it? Now, the Bible writer Paul is writing to a group of people in an ancient city called Ephesus. And I believe what he is doing, and there's lots of different opinions of why he's writing and what he's writing, but I think what he's writing to to these people is this issue of conflict, and what Paul is saying is there's a pattern or there's a cycle that all conflict follows. And if you have your sermon note that's in the program you were given, you can follow along with the Scripture. And I'm just going to give you a very quick kind of overview of this cycle this morning of which I think all conflict follows. The first thing Paul says is that it starts with a wound or a hurt. He says this, so stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbor the truth, for we are all part of the same body. I think what he is saying there is that one example of a wound or a hurt is when we lie and we don't tell the truth. In fact, I think that's the primary way that we can hurt one another, is that we lie or there's betrayal or there's deception or we live a lie or we withhold the truth or we pretend or whatever. I think it's the common way that we wound one another. So he says it starts with some kind of a hurt or wound. That's how this conflict deal gets started. The second thing he says is that this, it leads to some kind of reaction. And the most common reaction to a hurt or wound is what? Anger. Anger is the emotion of choice for most people in some, when they've been wounded or hurt. And he says these words, And don't sin by letting anger get the best of you or control of you. Now, anger is simply an emotion, often the emotion of choice, but it is simply emotion like any other emotion that we have. And you couldn't live a passionate life if you couldn't get angry. And so anger is, it's not a terrible thing because it's an emotion, but it also has a physiological side. You know how it goes. The adrenaline gets uh, secreted and the sugar uh, is released and your heart beats faster and blood pressure goes up and we move from our logical brain where we think rationally to the primal part of our brain where fight or flight happens. And that's why we usually withdraw or attack at this point. Now, anger really is simply sing- signaling that something needs our attention. There is something happen- happening that needs to be changed or fixed. It's a call for action. It's like a smoke detector going off. You know, you're in bed and you're sleeping and the smoke detector goes off because it always goes off then. And uh, you kind of go, what's going on? And it requires you to get out of bed and take some action. And if, if, if there's a fire, it's to find out where the fire is and to sort that out. And yet, so anger is something that gets our attention. And the most common ways that we deal with anger is either we blow up or we bottle it up. Some people choose more often to blow up. And they kind of spew this these toxins all around. They, they, you know, sometimes it takes the form of criticism. We attack someone's character, their personality, or their physicality. It can be in the form of contempt, which is all about name calling or belittling or demeaning or belligerence or some sort of hostility, you know, or, or, or in words or an attitude. Sometimes it can be control and intimidation. Sometimes we use anger to control and intimidate somebody else. Um, And because it creates fear and manipulation. This is the fight mode. Blow up is the fight mode that some go in. The other option is the flight mode, and that is to withdraw. That is to bottle it up. Instead of spewing it outwardly, we store it inwardly. We take the toxic poison of anger, we bottle it up in our soul, and we kind of put a lid on it. And if we leave there long enough, because it's a poison, it poisons us on the inside. And it plays out in a a dozen different ways in our relational world. And then some, for many, it boils and boils and boils until finally the lid doesn't stay on, and it kind of explodes. And wonder, where did that come from? And our culture sends messages that these two are okay. You know, I hear people say, well, I was just blowing off some steam. Or someone else will say, well, I need to just hold it in. And, and I, I think both are dangerous, and both don't help us to deal with conflict. By bottling up the anger or by blowing up, it says that we're letting anger get control of us. And then it goes from there. After it leads to this reaction, usually anger, he says that you need to deal with this quickly. 
And that's where he says these words. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. He's saying you need to deal with this quickly. We really do. Anger, I said, is like a smoke detector. It tells us there's a fire something somewhere, or something's causing a fire. But if it's constantly going off, which it was never designed to do, we need to determine why. We need to sort that out. We need to know the reasons behind it. We need to settle it, sort it out, set it aside, and move on. Here's what some people do when they hear the smoke detector going off. They do not check for the fire. They don't check to the reason why it's going off. They simply unplug the smoke detector, take out the battery, turn off the power. And some of us do that because our natural tendency is to avoid wanting to be in any kind of conflict. Our tendency is to bury it, to sweep it under the carpet, and not deal with the issue that has inflicted the wound or created the emotion. We ignore it. And if you don't deal with this this quickly, if you let it fester thinking, ah, no big deal, we'll just let it blow over and we'll talk to each other in three or four days and then we'll sort of be back to normal, which a lot of people do, it leads to this. You're giving the devil an open door. That's what he says. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. And a foothold is this idea of a peddler in that day, and like a door-to-door salesman in our day. When they'd come up, they'd put their foot in the door so you couldn't close it. And it allows you to speak through that crack in the door. And, 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 and where the evil one speaks to is in our mind. And our thinking gets negative and it gets toxic and we think about getting even and maybe ending the relationship and forgiveness is out of the question and... Um, you know, we, we, we have these critical thoughts and contemptuous thoughts, and they're just downward spiral. And this can happen really quickly. You give him a foothold, and he, he, he takes over. And he stirs up your thinking, and he replays the, the wound and the hurt and all that over and over again in your thinking. And before long, this happens. We start to get kind of selfish. We get selfish. We start being self-focused, self-absorbed. It's all about us, all about winning the conflict, all about our desires, our needs, our wants aren't being met. Now, there's this funny verse here that he says. He says this. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for hard work and then give generously to uh, others in need. Now, I'm reading that and going, how does this fit? A lot of others think too, because he's talking about relationships and then he talks about stealing. And, and what many um, commentaries think is that he's not just randomly putting thoughts out there, but this has to fit with the rest of the thoughts. And they're thinking it, what he's saying is, is a lot of people, what they do is they get really selfish and it's about them and they begin to steal. They begin to take it in for them. It's all about me. I, and that's what stealing is all about. And he says, instead of thinking about themselves, they need to start thinking about others and sacrifice for others. And, and, and he says that that's what's going on, but that's so what happens in this process. We get very, very selfish. And when you get to that point and having your own little personal pity party focused on yourself, bitterness and resentment form, and we create these grudges and our motivations change and our, what we want the outcome to be now is different and our desires change and our attitude is affected. And it gets really negative at this point. It always does when it's all about you and you start to be the victim and you start to blame And when that happens, this happens. It impacts the way you communicate. Look what he says. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so the words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. The word foul and abusive can be translated unwholesome. And it's, it, here's what it means in the, in the original language the Bible's written in. It's meat or fish or, or vegetables that are rotting. It's stinky, foul language. And sometimes we get abusive with our words and we say things we don't mean and we become critical and we become very negative. And instead of encouraging and building up, we begin to tear down with our words, which lead to this next thing. It grieves the Holy Spirit. He says this, don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you're living. Remember, he has identified you as his own Guarantee that you will be saved on the day of redemption. What he's saying here is that when we become followers of Jesus, the Bible tells us that we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do I get that, that the Holy Spirit lives in me? Not for a moment, but I'm told it does, and so I believe he, he does. And when the Spirit of God lives in me, the Spirit of God is to do work within me and to change me. And what is to be the byproduct of the Spirit of God in me is that I demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in my life in my life. But you get to this point, you stop demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. There's very little love, very little patience, very little peace, 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and there's not much joy at all. And when the Holy Spirit sees how we're supposed to be and we're not because we have not dealt with the conflict in the right way, it wounds the very heart of the Holy Spirit, which leads to the last, which I call the big six. He talks about bitterness, which is resentment, and you just, you know, you question motives and nothing's good anymore. Leads to rage, which is explosive anger. It leads to anger. He said, now, this anger word is a little bit different. This means to brood over. This is the low-level anger that's in relationships that question every motive, question everything the other person does, and always sees it negative, and they get angry at every turn, no matter what good or bad they do. He talks about brawling, and this is not, you know, mud wrestling. This is more of yelling and shouting. He's talking about slander, which is put down insults, criticisms, etc. Talks about malice, which is this deep content or hostility. Sometimes it's physical, but there are other forms that more deeply wound. And he says, you get to this point, and you get here, and you're getting really close to this relationship unraveling. And what happens is this is a cycle, and sometimes when the devil takes a foothold, we get really selfish, and we use words, and it cycles us back, and we use words that bring more hurt, and more wound, and more anger, and it doesn't get dealt with, and the devil gets a wider foot in the door. And that goes all over, and we cycle that through a few times, and eventually words are so insulting and the Holy Spirit is so grieved that we get to these, and we ramp these up, and we cycle through these over and over again, and eventually the relationship ends. <coughs> this is how it happens. This is the cycle that conflict takes. Now, you might be wondering, well, how do we deal with this? Well, I want to share an illustration, and then I want to ask you a question, and then I'm going to show you how. Here's the illustration. Many of you know I love to play baseball. In fact, I play baseball year round right now. I play indoors in the winter. I play outdoors in the summer. There's like five weeks off in the whole year from playing baseball. And one of the rules in baseball is is that when you're rounding third base in in softball or slow pitch, when you're rounding uh, third base and you're heading for home, about 20 feet from home plate, there is a line. And it's called the line of no return. And when you cross that line and you see the ball coming towards home plate, you can't stop and turn around and run to third. Once you cross the line of no return, you are committed to one direction and one direction only. And that's just the way the rule plays out. When it comes to the cycle of conflict that I have just talked about, do you believe there is a line of no return? Is there a line where you say, once you cross this line, it's hard to go back, or it's impossible to go backward? You are committed to going forward. Is there a critical point in the cycle that we need to focus on if we're going to handle conflict well? That's the question. The answer is yes, there is a piece of this. And my guess is you've already figured it out. It is that we've got to sort it out quickly. What makes it or breaks it when it comes to handling conflict is whether we're able to choose to sort it out quickly or to let everything else that I've talked about happen. You see, wounds happen. We're porcupines. We wound one another. Anger happens. Blow up, bottle up, a combination of both. They happen. Fight or flight happen. Where we make it or break it is will we be willing to sort it out before the devil gets a foothold, before we get selfish, before our communication turns sour, before we wade into the waters of the big six. It is sorting it out quickly where we win or lose when it comes to the issue of conflict. And so I just want to look briefly at how we do that this morning. Now, it's not going to be my words. It's going to be Jesus' words that we're going to follow this morning to figure this out. Now, you need to understand what I'm going to use is a text. Jesus is talking to a wider group of people. He's talking to people in, some, in a spiritual community. And when they get in conflict, this is what they should do. But I, I know it's applicable to all forms of conflict when it happens. And this is what Jesus says. If another believer, if someone else sins against you, hurts you, wounds you some way, go privately and point out the offense, the wound, how they've been hurt, hurt you, how they've hurt you. And if the other person listens and confesses, the word confess always means the scripture simply to agree with, to agree with. If they agree with it, you have won the person back. So 
Here's the advice. Now, the first piece of advice is not on this verse, but I know Jesus would give it to us because it's just real practical and real simple. First piece of advice is this one. Cool down. Cool down. When red-hot anger is brewing and stewing, take a time out and let your emotions, the physical side and the emotional part of anger, give them a chance to return to normal levels. Cool down. Take the time to take a walk. Don't get in your car. It's not a good place when you're angry. Walk. Go to part of your house. Sit. Think. Read. Amuse yourself with TV. Do a hobby. Do whatever. Just do whatever it takes to cool down. But here's what I want you to do. I think this is really important. If you're going to do that, make sure you let the other person know that's exactly what you're doing. You know, you might say something like, you know what? I'm really angry right now and we need to take a break. We need to cool down and we're going to talk about this later. It's just saying, we got to do that. We got to let the emotional um, sort of anger begin to cool down. So that's the first thing. Here's the second thing that Jesus says that we need to do. Acknowledge there's an issue. What does he say? If someone has wounded you, he's saying if it's happened, acknowledge that it's happened. If someone wounds or hurts you, we need to admit that we have been wronged and determine why we've been wronged and what is at the root of it. It's about admitting there's a conflict. It's about saying, I hear the fire alarm going off. It's about determining, hey, why is it going off? Why the anger? Why the breakdown? What has got us to this point? Too many people in conflict just say this. Oh, it's no big deal. It'll blow over. Just let it pass. Just leave it alone. A couple of days we'll talk to each other. We'll never address the issue and everything will be fine. I don't believe that because you'll cycle through this time and time again until eventually it will not be fine. And so we need to acknowledge that there is an issue. Don't put it, sweep it under the carpet. Acknowledge it and say, yes, it's there. Thirdly, this one I'll spend the most time on. He says this. Initiate the conversation. What does Jesus say? Go. One little two-letter word. Go. Go and show how this has hurt or wounded you. Make the decision to address the issue of conflict instead of bearing it. You know what? When a conflict happens, when there's wounds and there's anger, you know what we do? We think, they started it. There is no way. I'm going to get stubborn until they're willing to come and talk to me because they started it. I'm not doing anything about this. I'm waiting it out. We get a little self-righteous and a little self-justifying. We can say it's their fault, they're to blame, I'm not moving. Guess what? Jesus doesn't give you that option. Jesus says, you go. Now, if you think you're the wounder and go, good, they've got to come to me, think different. Think different. Because in another passage where Jesus talks about relationships, he says, when you've wounded somebody else, he says, you go. So whether you've caused it or whether you're the sort of the target of it or whatever, both of you need to go and initiate the conversation. Now, before you go, there's probably a few things you should do before you have the conversation. One, there's, a, there's three questions I would ask. First question is, what is behind the anger? Because usually there's something behind why you got angry, and it's usually some kind of hurt, so identify that. Or it's some kind of fear, uh, identify that. Or some kind of frustration, um, and identify that. Or maybe it's a memory of the past that has been triggered. Just identify what is behind the anger. What made you angry in this, in this instance? What did they do? What, was it a hurt? Was it a wound? Was it a fear? Was it something in the past? Second thing, second question you want to ask is, what do you want the outcome of the conversation to be? You need to ask yourself that question. Do you want to win the argument and justify your point of view and perspective? Is that why you're going? Or do you want the relationship to be restored and the conflict to be resolved? What, why are you doing this? If you're going to win it, if you're in it to win it, it's not going to work out. Jesus says the goal is for us to go and to bring up reconciliation. He says because the goal, as he says in this verse, is win the person back. What? Why are you having the conversation? Thirdly, ask yourself, what part did I play in the conflict? Did I create some of this? Did I do something? Are there things that I said or did during the angry exchange that I need to admit to and own? So there are those three questions that we need to ask. 
Second thing we need to do is not only ask questions before we go, but you know what we need to do? We need to stop rehearsing the conversation. Because I know how it goes. I've done this so many times. I rehearse it over and over. And every reaction they're going to give me is a negative one. And I just get madder. And I just get angrier. And then when I have the conversation and they don't react, I don't know how to. So don't even rehearse it anyway. Thirdly, I would pray about it. Before I have the conversation, I would commit it to prayer for the details, for calmness, for the outcome, for the other person, for wisdom, for guidance, for the Holy Spirit to be pr- part of the whole process. I just pray. Fourthly, I would go, and I would want to go with the right attitude. I want to go. Go with the right attitude. It's so, so important. And Paul gives us that attitude. He says, instead of this cycle of conflict, be kind to each other. Go with kindness, tenderheartedness. Let your heart be sensitive. Forgive one another. Be ready to forgive because you've been forgiven, he says. Be like God. Do it God's way. Because you're, you're his children. You're supposed to you know, do it his way because you're adopted. Live a life filled with love. You know, choose love in all of this. Follow the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice, a pleasing aroma to God. He says, that's what we're to be like. We've got to go with the right attitude. Now, when you have the conversation, I think you have to enter that tunnel of conflict And you need to have the right goal in mind. So the aim has to be reconciliation and resolving the conflict. Secondly, deal with the issue at hand, the wound or hurt that has just happened, why it happened. Deal with that issue and only that issue, not the other issue you buried last week, last month, and last year. Don't try to clear the decks all at once. Deal with one issue, and it's the issue at hand. Don't generalize any statements. You know, you always or you never. And be ready to share your feelings. You already kind of know why you're angry. You already know it's a hurt or a wound or a fear or a frustration. And as Andrea said, use I statements. Don't go accusing or criticizing or showing contempt. And it might sound something like this. I know I was angry when you showed up late from work. When you don't call me when you're, when you're going to be late, it makes me feel like it's not all that big of a deal and that I'm not important to you at all. And that really hurts me because I watched my dad do this to my mom all the time, and their relationship didn't make it, and I don't want that for ours. It just say, that's why I am what, this is the feelings, this is the process. And then you say, and you know what, I didn't do this very well, and I said some things I regret, and I'm sorry. And it's being really sensitive to the other person's feelings. It's the golden rule of sensitivity. Be sensitive to them like you'd want them to be sensitive to you. It's making sure you have a short memory and you don't bring things up that you talked about before as sort of ammunition or weapons in this conversation. You speak the truth in love and grace and mercy, and you make sure all that needs to be said gets said. Don't hold back. Don't, you know, keep some of it in. Say it all, 100% of it. And if there needs to be consequences, talk about those consequences. Just don't make them a threat. And if there needs to be a boundary set, talk about it and agree on it. And if there needs to be expectation changes, talk about it and agree on it. And if you, if you need to see the change, a, a certain change happen, talk about that. You know, that illustration I gave, you know, the person in that might say, hey, all I ask you, if you're going to be late, just call. That's the change I need. And listen careful, carefully. You know, listen carefully to what's being said Maybe you have to do active listening, which is repeating back what you're hearing, just to make sure you got it. And at the end, here's the deal. When you go and you initiate the conversation and you do it to the best of your ability, don't take responsibility for their response or their reaction. If you've done what is right and they don't respond right, that's not your problem. Don't own it. Don't embrace it. Don't hold it. Don't take it. All right? So we have to initiate this conversation. And then lastly, I'll just skip over this real quickly. Don't involve anybody else. He says, go privately. Go privately between you and them. Privately is what another translation says. Keep it between the two of you. I mean, it is so easy to want to get a third party involved, right? So they'll take our position or affirm our perspective. And we feel like if I commiserate, it'll make me feel better. And you might, but you'll still be angry. We think talking to someone will lessen our anger. Most often it doesn't. It only fuels it. We think that it will reduce the emotion and the fact that's 
not what it does. And so we need to be careful that we don't go and share it all with someone else because that doesn't help. Now, there are times when you need to go to someone, maybe a counselor, maybe uh, someone who's an accountability partner, someone you, you, you would seek after for wisdom and get their advice and perspective on how you need to handle this. But when you do that, here's my advice. When you sit down and have the conversation, say, hey, I talked to my accountability partner and I got some advice and this is the advice they gave and I just wanna share this. You just, you know, declare it, declare it. But I'd avoid texting, phoning, or emailing your mother, your sister, your brother, or your best friend. Like I just wouldn't, because it doesn't help. It says go privately. Now, conflict is going to happen. All porcupines face it. There's going to be wounds. We're all going to be guilty of it. There's going to be hurts. There's going to be anger. Sometimes we're going to blow up. Sometimes we're going to bottle up. But when that happens, what choice will you make? Because you've got a choice here. You can choose to sort it out quickly, just as I've described it, as Jesus you know, kind of gave us some practical advice on how to do it. Or, or you can pretend it's not there. You can pull the plug on the, the, the smoke detector. Don't deal with what's causing the fire. Sweep it under the carpet. Let it go for you a few days. Talk you know, to each other, but never about it. And this cycle will happen over and over and over again. I can guarantee it. I can guarantee it. Because the conflict cycle, if it's not dealt with, is always a downward one. So what will you choose at this point? Now, I have to admit I've done both. There have been times I've chosen to sort it out right away, and I can't say that it always works out perfectly because it doesn't always. But I'm glad I chose in many relationships to sort it out. But there's been a few relationships where I didn't. One with, some, one with a sibling, one with someone I served in ministry with, and happened with a boss. And because I didn't sort it out, I got critical and negative towards that person. My emotions took a hit. It affected me spiritually. Some of them I had to hang around still and be around, and all I ever did was never want to be close to them, and I walked on eggshells when I was around them. And there are times I wonder, what if I had have chosen in those relationships to sort it out quickly? Would it have been different? I don't know. It takes two people to tangle, right? You know, like, and they may have not have responded. I don't know how they would have responded. But I have a sense it might have been better, and, I, and sometimes I go back and wish I had. There's no guarantee it's going to work. No guarantee you're going to get the right reaction. No guarantee that you're going to have reconciliation and restoration. No guarantee you're going to resolve the conflict if you do what Jesus said. But you got a much better chance of it happening if you do. If you do. Because every one of us has a face in mind of someone where we sorted it out with them and we love that relationship still. And there's another one we didn't sort it out quickly and we go, you know, that friendship ended. And when you think of the face of a child or a spouse or a friend or a boss or a coworker, you want the relationships to thrive and to survive. You don't want them to fail. And it comes right down to the one thing you have to choose at that point. Will I sort it out? Or will I ignore it and hope it goes away? Relationship that rocks says we will have conflict but we will choose to sort it out. Let's pray. Well, Father God, this morning we, we praise you and we thank you. And Oh, you are the God who works in our lives. And we want to commit to you this morning all of the relationships that we're in. And some of those are not good right now, Lord, and some of them are great. And I just pray, Lord, this morning that you will just give us the courage, that you will give us the courage this morning to look at those relationships that we're in and to choose to sort it out quickly if we still have the chance. And if we don't, then may we have learned lessons from past relationships that we will employ in future relationships. Father God, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for us so that we could be restored in relationship to you. And may that motivate us today as we celebrate communion, as we celebrate your death, Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at the center screen there. This is our motivation. 
It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting our sins against us, and he committed to us the message of reconciliation. What motivated, should motivate us is because our relationship with Christ brought reconciliation to the relationship with God. The Bible says that we were sinners separated from God, but Christ came and He died on a cross. Blood flowed, body beaten and broken so that we could be reconciled to God. And it's because of that relationship being reconciled, that we have to look more often at reconciling human relationships. It's the motivation. It is the motivation. And this morning, as we just get ready for communion, maybe one of your relationships, you need to confess some stuff. Paul said, if you have something against someone else, you need to confess that. And then later on, go and make it right. And so for a few moments this morning, we're just going to pause for just a few moments. And in the silence, we're just going to have a moment of confession. And maybe you have to say, God, you know what? I'm not right with you right now, but I want to be. I want to be restored and reconciled to you through Jesus. And maybe it's a prayer that needs to go heavenward. But maybe you need to say, God, you know what? There's a relationship in my world that's not good right now. And I want it to be reconciled. And maybe you say, and I've caused some, some of the pain and the hurt. And maybe you're saying, hey, I want to confess that to you. And when I get out of here, I'm going to try to sort it out. So let's pause and have a moment of confession. I'm going to invite those who are going to serve communion to make your way forward at this time. In the church of history, when men and women would come before God and confess, confess sin, confess that they were offside with somebody relationally, that they would have that time of confession that following that would be this prayer of absolution. This is a prayer of the ancient church. And I would just want to pray it today for those of us who have confessed. And the prayer goes this way, Our Lord Jesus Christ, who offered himself to be sacrificed for us to the Father, and who conferred power on his church to forgive sins, I as his pastor absolve you through my ministry by grace of the Holy Spirit, and that God would restore you in the perfect peace with him. You are forgiven. Amen. Father God, for those confessions that we have shared this morning, you know our heart. They were silent, but you know it. You heard them, and you love the confession of your people where they agree with you, saying, this is where we're offside with you or offside with someone else. You've heard our confession. And Father, you have promised that when we confess, you forgive our sin. And so we are now forgiven. There is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And may this communion service remind us now, Father, of your gift of your son, Jesus, whose body was broken and his blood was shed. Not simply so he could die to pay for the price of our sin, but by in the paying the price of our sin, we could be reconciled to you. And may our relationship that has been reconciled to you be the motivation to reconcile to one another. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. Bread that was the stripe because of wounds and hurts. 
bread where he said, this is my body that is broken for you. And then he took a cup, the cup of redemption, the cup of freedom. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This new way of relating with God is because blood had to be shed to pay the price for sin. That was just God's way. And Jesus' blood flowed on that cross as his body was broken so that he could be reconciled, so that we could be reconciled to God. And so if you are a follower of Jesus, you're invited to take a little piece of bread and a little cup and hold it, and we will eat together in a few moments in community. And while we do that, the team is going to lead us in a song, and you're welcome to listen to it as you get to know it and sing along at any time.
Jesus is stronger. Our shame was great, but not greater than his grace and his mercy and his love. So let's eat together, remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross. Our sins are forgiven, and we carry no more shame. We don't need to. We are forgiven. Let's eat as people forgiven by Jesus today. cup, this cup of redemption that says we are free from guilt and shame. But this cup says that we are, if we are followers of Jesus, we have been reconnected. Our relationship has been restored. We are reconciled to God. And when that happens, His Holy Spirit lives in us. And so as people reconciled to God because of the death of Jesus, let's remember His death and the shedding of His blood as we drink together. Father, we pray that you will now just let us leave feeling that sense of freedom. No more sin because you paid the price, Jesus. No more shame. You took it on yourself. May we walk out of here today in freedom because Christ has set us free. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need someone to pray with you today, Great folks will be here at the front. They'd be glad to pray for you. Relational issues or other issues, they just love to pray with you, and they're here because sometimes we just need someone to share words and intercede on our behalf on those things we're going through. God bless you. Have a great week.